Looking ahead. Challenges and opportunities in the changing world. Welcome to Talking Economics, a podcast by the Center for Economic Research and Graduate Education, Economics Institute. Do humans cooperate when facing extremely low survival chances? Are pre-existing social ties increasing one's chances of survival in life and death situations? Social linkages in extreme circumstances is what we will discuss today with our guest, Štěpán Jurajda. Štěpán is the Mellon Endowment Professor with tenure at SERGI, full professor at SERGE, Charles University, and a senior researcher at the Economics Institute of the Czech Academy of Sciences. He also serves as Deputy Minister for Science, Research and Innovation of the Czech Republic. His research interests lie in the field of applied microeconomics, econometrics, labor economics, and economics of transition. Welcome, Stepan. Well, thank you for having me. Stepan, today uh, I would like to talk to you about the topic that you engaged with relatively recently, Holocaust and survival in concentration camps. Can you tell us more about how you did get into this research? Well, it was through uh, an ex-student uh, of Sir G.I., who uh, used to uh, be the head of the Jewish community in Prague and, and also the, the head of the Institute of Theresienstadt Initiative, which is an NGO that was founded by survivors of Theresienstadt prisoners and which started collecting just amazing data. And their uh, uh, database, which is available online, which uh, allows one to uh, commemorate uh, the victims uh, uh, of the Holocaust, uh, is the f- is the founding uh, step of our analysis. We realized that one can um, use this data w- for statistical analyses, complement it with other sources of historical data, and as a result, we feel that we provide evidence that is relevant to a large and you know and very detailed. Uh, and deep uh, analysis of the Holocaust, in particular of the coping strategies of prisoners of uh, Nazi internment camps and ghettos. But um, the the literature that exists, uh, which is deep and detailed, is largely based on survivor testimonies. Mm -hmm. And survivor testimonies are, of course, fundamentally selective. Uh, There's no way to ask the vast majority of those who did not survive internment in Auschwitz and, and other camps. And so our evidence by its statistical nature deals with this issue, deals with this issue and um, our, our findings are uh, certainly consistent with the evidence that is offered by survivor testimony. So in that sense, we provide a complementary evidence and one that confirms and validates the qualitative research. So can you tell us more about the main results of your research? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you, you asked the, the question that you asked at the beginning, which is our research question, is whether humans cooperate when faced with extreme prolonged life and death situations, uh, extremely unfavorable situations. There's a, there is some evidence on this issue from a POW camp, prisoner of war camp, from the US Civil War mm-hmm. from the 19th century. So this evidence looks only at men, only at soldiers who form social bonds during battle, right? If you fight together in a military unit, certainly that is known to create strong social bonds for a good reason. And so what, what this uh, existing paper by American authors uh, does it, it shows that if you are captured and imprisoned in a deadly POW camp with a larger number of members of your military unit, you are more likely to survive. Now, this is valuable evidence and very novel, but we feel that we bring several new pieces of value added to the literature. First, the Holocaust is of real importance. Mm. It, it is just a, a and continues to be a major research topic. And as I already said, we, we feel that by providing statistical evidence, we do provide an important check on this huge and detailed uh, literature on survivor strategies and coping strategies of Holocaust victims. Number two, we have evidence not only on men and soldiers, but we have evidence on civilians and on women as well, because we measure for prisoners of the Theresienstadt uh, ghetto, we measure several types of their social networks. Uh, by social networks, I mean social linkages that allow you to know somebody, that you know, if, if you meet somebody in a camp, you realize, oh, I know this person. So what, what are the examples of 
of social linkages that we quantify, well, we know whether you resided with other prisoners in the, at the same address prior to deportation. We know this okay. for several dozen thousands of, of, per, of uh, Theresienstadt prisoners who resided in Prague prior to being deported. We know uh, whether you were a member of um, 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 a, in Theresienstadt, there was a male, uh, a chain male uh, group of people who shared a, a humor sat satirical magazine <laughs> weekly that they produced in one copy and was shared. So we know if you were a member and of... And this data is available. Yeah, well, we, we uh, you know, coded this data from existing archival sources and added it to this major database of mm -hmm. prisoners and, and their arrival times and the times of their death or times of departure, the database of the Theresienstadt initiative that I mentioned mm -hmm. at the beginning. Um, th another important example is that we, we know of a group of roughly a thousand um, uh, Jewish prisoners who of Theresienstadt who previously worked together in a um, agricultural labor camp uh, called Lipa. And uh, there, uh, yeah, they were supervised by one SS man, but it was not a deadly camp. They cooked for themselves. They shared food that was sent to them from home. They worked in the fields or in the in the brewery or things mm -hmm. like that. They 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 played chess tournaments and and so on. So and there is qualitative, you know, literature. There 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 are survivor testimonies where survivors argue that if you formed friendships, for example, by sharing food with somebody in this agricultural camp you had then had a better chance of surviving later on mm. under harsher conditions. And indeed, this is what we show statistically. So we show that if if you have more of people who were imprisoned with you in this camp around you when you face life and death situations, indeed, that is helpful uh, for survival. We have some family linkage data, etc. So we have like six or seven measures of social linkages of this type. and. We are, let's focus on one main type, main result that we get, which is we look at roughly twenty transports of uh, prisoners from Theresienstadt to Auschwitz Birkenau, mm -hmm. which was obviously a deadly um, uh, labor camp and extermination camps. And what we do is we we don't. Uh, try to explain why certain transports had very low or relatively high survival rates. By relatively high, I still mean incredibly low. I mean, the highest survival rates for a transport you know, would be on the order of 20%, but many, many transport had close to zero or let's say 2%, 3% survival rates. Mm -hmm. So only three out of 100 prisoners arriving would ultimately survive the Holocaust. But we, we are not trying to explain these differences across transports because we believe that they correspond to conditions that the SS has created at a given point in time in transport. Those are kind of aggregate decisions taken by the SS. But we condition on these differences and we ask whether the survival probabilities within each transport depend on, for each individual, whether that individual arrived in Auschwitz with a larger number of potential friends based on our six or seven mm -hmm. measures of social linkages. And so we basically take the varying social linkage composition of transports mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as the source of variation for our comparisons. So on, on a, a particular, um, let's say, former prisoner of the Lipa camp will, so, you know, somebody of, of this type and age and etc. will arrive on one transport in, at Auschwitz with, let's say, five friends from potential friends from Lipa and on another with 50 or 100. So, so we use these comparisons statistically to derive at our conclusion which is that um, both social linkages that existed prior to the outset of the of the World War II that that you know measure some linkages from the pre-war or pre-deportation society, as well as linkages and social ties that were formed during imprisonment, mm -hmm. both help survival in in Auschwitz, and both for men and women. And if anything, the the uh, effects seem to be somewhat larger for women. So. Now, um, again, this, we, we believe this, this is new evidence for the historical research of the Holocaust. It, it is evidence that uh, extends what we know about um, uh, survival behavior and coping strategies in life and death situations. And I guess the main, um, uh, kind of to, to put it very simply, the main conclusion for us is that even in the most uh, harsh situations that would lead one to complete despair, 
even when survival rates are are just abysmally low and people face extended um, uh, extreme uh, harsh conditions and face death every day even then it is helpful it's not just to chance who survives it is actually helpful to remain open to forming social bonds and friendships because it's ultimately close friendships among small groups uh, of people who provide each other with help and protection and, and so on that actually statistically do predict survivor it's not all about just uh, random faith and and being close in terms of uh, you know I'm, I'm an introvert so, so i mean it's not 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 being open and seeking out uh, friends it actually hurts one's survival which is something that is well known from the literature on stress and health Mm -hmm. It is well known that social networks uh, mediate uh, the negative effects of stress on health outcomes, but providing this kind of evidence from the extreme of Auschwitz-Birkenau is something that we believe are the first to do in this literature. That's amazing. Uh, this is that you you added a lot of uh, new new outcomes to existing research, historical research. Speaking about today's world, would you say that the lessons that you learned are applicable also to some situations in uh, the current world? Right. I, th I think they are. Uh, now, first, it is really research about the Holocaust, right? That, that there is still very good reason to study the Holocaust. And, and so we think this is really our primary contribution. Now. At the same time, the, the number of people who were, um, you know, forcefully displaced from their homes and, um, uh, you know, forced migration, as well as, you know, it, that number is historically at global highs in the last couple of years. And if you look at the world today, you will find several locations where there are large systematic internment camps in place in Western China, possibly in Syria and other places. Um, where people end up uh, being prisoners of, well, being in internment camps for quite an extended period of time. And while these internment camps may not be as harsh and as deadly as those that I, um, you know, talked about uh, yes. today, uh, those that are in our, described in our research or those that correspond to the POW camp that I mentioned at the beginning, they are still unfriendly and harsh places. And so if one is socially, our research suggests that if one is socially isolated in the social map of such an internment camp, that is costly. And it may be costly uh, uh, in terms of health outcomes and our outcomes, uh, even when, even though, uh, of course, the survivor rates are much higher in those mm -hmm. camps, but they're still uh, in very difficult places to live and, and to survive. So we think in that sense, yeah, again, if if it helps to seek out friends and, and form mutual small support groups, kind of small communes, if it helps for survivor in Auschwitz, it is quite likely that it helps uh, with all sorts of outcomes, even in less deadly internment camps. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I know this is stretching it a little too far, but to me, the current situation in Ukraine, particularly in some of its parts, also presents an extreme situation or circumstances with regular bombing and shortages of all sorts. Uh, would you say that the outcomes of your research are applicable or there are other forces that come to um, place in, in this sort of situation? Right. So, so we look at internment, and, and sustained extreme life and death threat every day. Now, uh, the, living in a society which is an active all-out war is obviously incredibly stressful. It is very dangerous. It is deadly. And, and a, for a society to survive in an all-out war for national existence or independence, you indeed need uh, a lot of res society-wide resilience and mutual uh, help. But I, I think that uh, our results should not be taken out of the context of an internment camp. It, it is really a very specific result that, that we uh, provide. Now, th there is a literature on on society uh, resilience in, in wars. Uh, some in economics or in sociology 
other fields of social science. I will mention that there's also work that asks the question of how do nations deal with the kind of natural inclination for free riding mm -hmm. when it comes to selecting the young uh, or you know or middle-aged uh, people who are willing to go and die for one's country to be mm -hmm. killed in action to 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 put oneself at the risk at the significant risk of being killed in action is an you know act of of uh, sacrifice for one's uh, country or nation and uh, so there's a literature on how countries deal with the uh, potential free riding where one would perhaps want somebody else's son to die on the front and not my son right and so uh, I have actually a, a paper with Dejan Kovac that was published a couple of years back where we showed that values inculcated by parents in early childhood could actually be very important for one's uh, adult life decision to volunteer uh, for uh, active duty in an all-out uh, deadly war. Our evidence comes from the war between Croatia and Serbia and, and shows that um, uh, you know so, something about intergenerational transmission of values uh, being important for the decision of young Croatian men to volunteer in, in, in 91 uh, to fight uh, against the Serbian uh, forces. So now I will also mention that a colleague of mine, Vasily Korovkin, has a paper in the American Economic Review that looks at the economic costs away from uh, from the f battlefront um, that have to do with the, with the uh, loss of trust uh, between societies that uh, results from an armed conflict. And what they show is that Ukrainian firms that um, uh, reside in areas where there's fewer Russian-speaking uh, uh, people in Ukraine, mm -hmm. that, that that there is more of a loss of trust there, there and, and that these firms therefore suffer economically more and have to reorient uh, uh, you know, their, their sales towards other countries or other parts of Ukraine because they will not be able to sell their products uh, to Russia. Whereas firms that are located in parts of Ukraine with larger share of Russian-speaking population suffer less in, economically. And so again, that, that suggests that conflicts can be economically de damaging outside of just the, you know, the, the destruction of life and, and property in combat areas. And, and their results cannot be fully explained by decline in consumer demand, where we would not want to buy Russian products anymore or on the Russian side, Ukrainian products. But they, they suggest that uh, social networking and trust is really at the core of the, the economic effects that they measure. So I guess what I'm trying to say that while our results from the Holocaust are very specific to internment camps, there is indeed a growing literature on society-wide resilience in, in conflicts or under threat, when societies come under threat, that show how both local communities and entire nations um, generate uh, their defenses, so to say, and how people systematically help each other when faced with uh, a combat situation or when faced with an invasion. Thank you. Uh, I hope that we will have Vasily in our podcast in the near future, so he will speak more about his uh, uh, research. Uh, is there anything more you would like to add to this topic? No, I think I'm, I'm, I've pretty much exhausted my uh, 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 my expertise, but I, I might add just one more thing uh, that has to do with social linkages. Uh, coming back to the research uh, again with Dejan Kovac, where we look at health outcomes of the soldiers that have fought for Croatia in the 91-95 war between Croatia and Serbia. And um, what we show is that if soldiers have experienced more carnage in their military unit during the war, that is, if more of one's comrades from the same military unit have died, have been killed in action during mm -hmm. the war, then that has consequences for mortality of the soldiers who were not killed in action 20 years after the war. Now, it is well known that people who are uh, facing combat situations may face both mental and, and physical health issues, PTSD, etc. Uh, our evidence, I think, is different in that we actually have exact measures of how many of one's comrades mm -hmm. were killed. And the interesting 
thing about our findings to be confirmed, this is all in kind of it's still research in progress, is that it seems that there there are two groups of soldiers in Croatian army at that time. It's the volunteers and mm. the draftees. And it seems that the volunteers react more in their post-war health outcomes to how many other volunteers were killed in action during the war, and that the draftees react more in their post-war health outcomes to how much uh, death uh, was visited upon their other draftees inside uh-huh. their military units, uh-huh. which would suggest that these deaths of, of seeing somebody die who was close to me is is more painful and has more negative health outcomes, you know, within a closely knit uh, unit, right? So if if the volunteers are closer friends with each other, mm-hmm. and if the draftees are closer friends with each other because they came at, to these units at a different time during the war, okay. they came through a different mechanism, and so if if they are closer 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 to each other in terms of their social bonds, then it's also potentially more uh, painful or hurtful to them if they see many of their brothers in arms uh, die in, in this uh, conflict. So which would again, uh, you know, I, I, that's an empirical question. It could go either way. On the one hand, this, this close network of friends could offer more protection because you have other brothers in arms or sisters in arms. Mm-hmm. There, there were not too many women in that war. But um, to to rely on for support, or alternatively, as we seem to be finding, it might be a, 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 a larger cost to see somebody close to you die with longer uh, health consequences. Mm. Well, good luck with your research, and thank you for being with us. Well, uh, thank you again for having me. Mm-hmm.